Hi, I'm Lisa Scottolini, and I wanted to talk to you about Eternal, and specifically one part of Eternal, which is Elisabetta's passion. If you've seen the previous videos, you know that Elisabetta is the main character in this book, and she grows up in Rome in the 1930s, and she develops a passion. Well, what passion? What's my passion? Food. Everybody knows Italy has amazing food and amazing pasta and amazing pizza. And she, but the truth is, I stop myself because food is about more than that, isn't it? It's really about more than carbohydrates. It's really about connections for her. Now, for me, I grew up with a really loving mother and we're Italian American. We're in my kitchen, by the way. And she made pasta for us every Sunday, homemade pasta. And I watched her making gnocchis, making ravioli, making lasagna, making regular pasta. She had a machine with a crank. Um, I love all of those memories and all of those recipes are in my mind. And I gave all of those experiences to Elisabetta. Sadly, Elisabetta didn't have a great relationship to her mother like I did to mine. But as people do, she finds surrogates in life. She meets an older woman. They, she calls her Nona, like her grandmother. And Nona is a true pasta professoressa, a teacher. And she teaches Elizabeth how to make all of these pastas in the back of the restaurant that Nona owns. And how which sauces go with which pasta and why you serve certain pastas and what weather and all of the mysteries and secrets of pastas. And Elizabeth soaks that up. Also that love, also that attention that she craves. What I like to do when I do research, besides go to Rome, which I'll tell you about in a little bit, is that I like to use the things that are in the actual book. You know, I have a, a pasta machine with a hand crank, and they had those in 1930s, but I wanted to use something that they had also at that time, which is a little more interesting. This is called a chitara. It is a pasta machine. It is a very low-tech pasta machine. Chitara means guitar in Italian. You can see why, right? And the way it works is you take the, and I did this for the book, not very well, but I did it. Um, you take the pasta dough and you put it on the top and you flatten it out with a roller, because you can see there's these tines kind of, and or strings, wire strings, and then you roll it out, you roll the dough and it falls through, the tray comes out the bottom, and then you can just dry it on racks or wire hangers, or whatever things you have around. And that's what Nona does in the book. In the novel, she uses that chitara, and Elisabetta watches her. Now, why does that matter? Well, to me, it's like I said before. Elisabetta, for her, she ends up in the novel, I'm not giving anything away. She works in a restaurant because she loves food so much and also because she has to learn, earn money. By the way, I was a waitress for a long time too. I use all that in the book. And she ends up wanting to own a restaurant, I won't tell you if she does or not, because she loves the connection that food gives her. I think we all have those associations with food to a certain extent, and I think it's especially true about Italy. Like, if you're gonna write a novel about Italy, it should have pasta, it should have pizza, there should be some thick red sauce or gravy, depending on your dialect. And that's all in this book too. Elisabetta loves food because she loves to feed people. She loves to nurture people. And she finds herself a little bit on her own. So she's gotta open up her arms and just feed a city if she can. And she almost does in this book. I love that and I think it's important because as, I, as I've said in previous um, videos, every novel you write has to, and I've written 30 some, uh, and I really think this is the culmination of my career in many ways. Um, it has to have an emotional truth. It's fiction, so it's not literally true. But as Francis Ford Coppola said, nothing in my movies ever happened, but all of it is true. He directed The Godfather. There has to be core universal truth. And universal truth in this is taken from my life and my passion for food. And I gave her the passion for food. And that, that, that passion for connecting She's a people person, but she's a little lonely. She's reaching out in this way. That resonance that I think we all have of growing up in a family and feeding people and my mother's pasta recipes and your aunt's pasta recipes. We were big on eggplant parm in this family. My, my daughter, Francesca, makes the best eggplant parm and she, she's patient, part of it. 
unlike her mother. And it is my mother's recipe for eggplant parm. We wanted to get on a farm. I live on a farm. We wanted to name it Eggplant Parm Farm because that's how crazy we are about Eggplant Farm. And I will say to you that, of course, it's about more than Eggplant Farm because the other day I was actually cleaning out this refrigerator over there, if you can imagine that. And I went in the freezer and I found this Tupperware container that my, was my mother's Eggplant Parm. Now she has passed many years now, which still seems unbelievable to me. But there it was, right in the freezer. And of course, you know, I burst into tears, but in a happy way too, because I remember all those eggplant parms she made for us and all those times we made them together and all sitting around and the oil popping and the bread crumbs and trying to get the egg not to stick to your hands and all the great tactile stuff of food and all those memories stick to you just like flour and egg, don't they a little bit? And so that's how I felt when I saw that eggplant. And of course I couldn't throw it away, but you know, interestingly, I couldn't eat it either. I'm never gonna eat it. I mean, I couldn't bring myself to. So there's a little piece of my mother in there. And I think we all have that. I think we all have a little piece of our family and our love in our hearts, somehow rolled up with some dough somewhere, covered with some sauce, consumed and becoming a part of us the way food does. I really wanted that emotionality in this book. There is no better place for emotionality and food than Italy and Rome, Elisabetta, so from my kitchen to yours, I hope you love it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. I know that that video was a little long. I recorded it and it was a very serious frame of mind because tonight is gonna to be the most fun one because we're talking about something that we all love, which is food. And so this is the welcome to, I'm Lisa, and this is welcome to Behind the Book in Eternal. Now, as we know, I don't talk about the book per se, but I like to talk about the stuff that informs the book and the research behind the book. And there is so much food in this book and there's a really good reason for that. First off, in my defense, I love food. But secondly, it is so Italian and it is so important to the characters in this book. And I will tell you why it matters even historically. So let's start with Elisabetta, the main character. She works in a restaurant. She starts to learn to make pasta. It is part of her soul. Marco works in a cafe. He makes coffee. His mom's in the back. Sandro, his, he lives with a cook. The cook is from Ascoli Piceno. I actually managed to wedge an old family recipe of mine because my dad's side is from Ascoli Piceno. It's stuffed olives, olive, ascolani. And the point is that food really informs so much of Italian culture. And the real thing is, it's just a pleasure. That's the real point I want to make. I don't know if you guys are watching the Stanley Tucci on CNN, but it's such a wonderful series and he's talking about searching through Italy through food and the food of all of the different provinces. And so the whole thing is every time he puts some food in his mouth, he goes, oh my God. And that's really the reaction of the culture. There's great permission to just take your time when you eat, savor every bite, just enjoy the sensual pleasure of eating and really, really great fresh food. And so of course, when I went to Rome and did my research, I ate my way through everything out. I just wanna give you a little taste because you can talk about food, but then again, you can show it. And showing it, look, this is my favorite. You can't beat it, right? It's just, it's just pasta with tomato sauce. Here's my second favorite, pasta with clam sauce, every dish. Everything was unbelievable. And it wasn't expensive. We didn't go in expensive restaurants. We just, I was trying to eat the neighborhood ones. And the other thing about food is that it's a memory. It's a memory of a person, like I talked about in the video, whether you made the food with that person or it's just food that that person loved. I cannot eat rigatoni without thinking of my dad. My dad loved rigatoni. You know why? Because rigatoni is unbelievable. And it's very sad, but even at his funeral, we, ser we served it. And everybody knew, oh yeah, Frank loves rigatoni. Um, I did have the occasional salad, but, it, but it, even that, it's fresh, it's exciting, it's got arugula, it's got radicchio, it's got a little bit of a tang. Then of course, the interesting thing about the food in Eternal is that as Stanley Tucci points out, the food is regional. And if you saw the episode that he filmed in the Jewish ghetto, 
which is such a major part of eternal, you will know that he showed you the special food. And of course, that's what I did. I ate the food. I put the food in the, in the book. And so the Jewish quarter, the, the, the fried foods are such a delicacy. First of all, great pasta in the ghetto, the so-called ghetto. It's the Jewish quarter in Rome. Huge, huge portion, which I love. Um, here is the kosher bakery. You can probably fit about four people in this bakery. And the line was at the back. I mean, everybody was just, this was the place to be, to get. Here is the main delicacy. Fried artichokes, artichokes every which way. Roman cuisine does so much with artichokes. And I love artichokes, even though they're a lot of trouble. Um, Francesca loves them. She's home now. We get them. We just, you know, it's just really an excuse for butter, but it is unbelievable. Yeah, Paula, rigatoni with vodka sauce. Delicious. I mean, the salads look beautiful because the presentation, as you know, is so much a part of the pleasure of it. What does it look like when it comes? How does it make you feel? Happy, joyful, let's have fun, let's celebrate. And I will show you, tell you one quick story about food. So here is the pizza that made me cry. I was going around, right, with Laura. We're, we're researching. I'm dying for pizza. So there's a, a pizza place right outside of the Vatican. I took a bite. This was one of those things where they bring you this pizza, and it's supposed to be like, well, it's for you, but it's really big, and your first thing is, oh, I can't eat this. And then instantly you start eating it. And I took the first bite of this, and I actually cried. This is the pizza that made me cry. It was so good. It was such a pleasure. It was amazing and it was so weird because I actually started to cry and, and then the waiter walked by and I grabbed him which is a little weird and I'm like do you know this is so good it is making me cry and he's like lady like get off of me but the bottom line is that that is how good the food is in, in Rome and I really wanted to get that in this book and to do that not only did I have to eat it and try to but I really wanted to have authentic recipes so I got a whole bunch of cookbooks and anybody who knows cookbooks you know Here's one classic cuisine. This is from my best friend too, from Franca. And all about the cuisine of the Jewish quarter because I was really wanted proper recipes. I wanted it to be authentic. I wanted it to be the real ingredients. I wanted it to be seasonal. Here's Tasting Rome. All incredible, incredible cookbooks. People, if you guys love food, you know that reading cookbooks is cookbooks, just sitting and reading them and imagining the food and the ingredients, none of which you'll ever have in your house. But here's a basic one that's a British cookbook. I was just, there's so much about pasta and there's so much of pasta in this book because I don't want to give too much away, but Elisabetta works for a pasta professoressa, a teacher of pasta making. And that is secretly my mom, but we'll talk about that more. The geometry of pasta. I learned all about why certain shapes are with certain sauces, why you want a complex shape like a radiator pasta for certain lighter sauces because it will trap the sauce. So if you use a heavy sauce, it makes the whole meal too heavy. Not too heavy for me because I love heavy food, but that's the idea. And of course, Marcella Hazan, who's just so sadly passed away recently, but these cookbooks are on you. When you go through the book, you'll see the authenticity of the recipes. I really, really wanted that. And I'll tell you the historical point why it matters, not to give anything away about the book. But imagine how sensual and a pleasure eating is in Italy and Rome and how much it matters to the culture. And then if you set it in the time, in the 1930s, very important eating, but then what starts to happen, the novel takes place over a 20 year time period. Fascism comes in and then the war comes on. And when, when Italy disastrously enters the war as fascists on the side of the Nazis, for a long time Mussolini can't decide, then he decides, terrible decision. The, the war breaks out and all the food is rationed. And there is so much bombing done to Italy, and I'll explain it in the book, I don't want to give too much away, but the wheat fields are decimated. People can't make pasta, the eggs are gone. There's a thriving black market. There's all kinds of crime and corruption, all about trying to get enough food because the next thing that happens is when the Nazis come in and occupy Rome, which is told in the book, they weaponize the food. They starve the Jewish ghetto intentionally. And so for you to really feel that deprivation when you read this novel and how much that hurts these characters, not only are they starving, but they are, their main pleasure is taken from them. Unfairly, these would be the rest of the population because of these regulations that fascism's enacted against Jews. You feel at the beginning how much it matters, 
and you feel the, the deprivation of it and the frustration and the anger and the agony when you're trying desperately just to stay alive until the Americans get there. There is much, much food in Eternal and it reinforces all of these points. Character, time, location, and history. That's really what, it, what is really behind the book. And I did want to take a second, since I mentioned in the videos, to talk about how much food means to all of us, I know you feel the same way, to our family. So I'm going to invite my daughter Francesca here. You know she's been joining me. Ciao. Ah, she speaks it. <laughs> a novelist in her own right. She's written her first novel, Ghost of Harvard. But she is the main pasta cook in our house. And I wanted to show you some, some pictures that are sort of our personal family These pictures. These are my favorites. But you're our personal family. So here is my mother, Mother Mary. I can't even point. Who I call it. Muggy. I will tell you, here she is with Francesca. And my mother is, I will tell you, she's wearing a t-shirt that says, do you remember what it says? Says, you bet your ovaries I'm Italian, <laughs> which, <laughs> which I think some a reader made I, for I, us. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But anyway, here she is making gnocchis. And that was, as I said in the thing, she, she made she homemade all the time. Right. She was not a potato gnocchi fan. She was a red. And it was so, oh yeah, Anne, right. She said, it hurts to listen to this. I know it was such delicious food. And she made it with Francesca. It was really your thing with her. I would sort I of like... I loved cooking with her. Well, you two would fight too much. <laughs> See, I was kitten to my grandmother. I was her little... She took, she took it easy on me. So we loved to cook together. And you would always hang out in the, in the kitchen and just right. provide colorful commentary. That I was, was like the sous chef. I was she the was the peanut over. gallery. That's what my grandmother would call her. So, <laughs> But yeah, you know, when I think about cooking with her, so fun. It was also always something we did together in part because she would not write a recipe down ever right, right. ever that was a right. rule i remember i was like at a, a bridal shower once and it was like let's all write recipe cards and i was like what's a recipe card because my grandmother as a rule would never write a recipe down even if you asked her to and there have been like we never got a straight answer of why that was the rule i think I think in part it was because she didn't work from a recipe. She had, you know, this was passed down from generations right. when I would, she didn't know the answers. I mean, it was literally about, you know, what's the quantity. She wasn't measuring it. For that record in Yonke, she'd be like, well, you know when it's this wet or when it's this sticky or when it's this tacky. It was all sort of about the feel, which I right. really do think is so, right. you know, Italian. But I also have a little theory that it was, it was so that we would always do it together. You know, I mean, and that really was such a pleasure. I was, I, I never missed having it written down, even now, because I learned it with her. I remember it well enough. It's also like the, it doesn't have to be perfect, which is a nice vibe in Italian cuisine. You know, it's, it's not French cuisine. Add, <laughs> add a little extra salt, add a little less of this. It's not the end of the Right, world. and there was one time, and it will be on the website, that her gnocchi recipe, because so many people are asking about it. And ravioli. It, um, her ravioli was amazing. Her pasta was amazing. But we're going to have her gnocchi recipe on the website, because one time I said to her mom, you just have to tell us what it is. And I think, I can't remember if you took the notes. Yeah, I, think I think you took yeah, notes. I tried. I was sitting no, around to just track you know, what we were doing. Having but beer, really, but... gnocchi is all about the technique. I, I, doesn't the term? It comes from like some uh, uh, the idea, the term, the word from the motion with your thumb. But actually, my grandmother and many other people who make gnocchi would actually use more her ring finger. I'll think, see if I can, where you would roll the pasta. You'd press your finger into it this way. So you'd roll it towards you, and then you'd right. flick it into the done pile. Right. Right. So it was like this. And the reason you do that is because the thick little, you know, kind of a gnocchi is sort of a dumpling shape or maybe like a little nugget shape. But if you indent it, that's the only way that it will cook through evenly without either overcooking the exterior or leaving the interior undercooked. You have to indent it. And also, so that's the she had the a motion, the a, flick. The flick. And yes. she had a secret ingredient, which I won't tell you, but it is in the recipe. And we wrote down, yeah, I'm not going to say it all. I looked at it before. Um, and of course, at the end, you get to dance to Sinatra in the kitchen. Dance around so this is me dancing with my mother, and Francesca took the picture. And it's just so, um, it's like I said, I think we all feel the same way, and I can tell from what you guys are saying. You know, food, family, memory, and emotionality. These things are all connected. And I think especially now, this is a real pleasure. When you read Eternal, I wanted you to feel that pleasure. I wanted you to be transported to that time because it really is simple. You know, sometimes we complicate our relationship to food and everybody's telling all these things. But the bottom line is, it really is a pleasure in life. And these simple pleasures. And it's something that really can bond people and bring, yeah. you know, you come together around a table. And I think that's 
so poignant too in your book that there were these communities and cultures that were knit together right and then when they were torn apart you know food becomes a, you have to tear that too because otherwise you know food can be such a bridge between cultures right right um, so that's really the food of italy the food of rome the food of eternal that's what we wanted to say <laughs>